Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar from NTT Data about achieving growth in today's disrupted automotive market. I'm Tim Rose, I'm the editor of AM, and I'm going to be chairing this webinar. In a moment, we have a couple of presenters for you, for you who will be sharing their expertise and valuable insights into how dealers can maximize the market well, currently and, and going forward. So they comprise Ian McVicker, the head of automotive retail consulting at NTT Data, and Ian Plummer, the commercial director at Auto Trader. Well, in a moment, they'll begin the presentation. But before they do, can I just remind you how you can get involved? Um, you'll have joined us in listen only mode but you will all have a tab marked Q&A on your webinar dashboard. So please do type some any questions you have into here, because after the presentation, we've got about 15 minutes or so of Q&A with our presenters. So anything you want to you want to um, question or anything you want points you want to raise, um, please do, and we'll put them to the to the panel. So. That's enough for me. You're not here to, to hear from me. You're here to hear from our expert presenters. So I'll now pass over to Ian McVicker for your presentation. Over to you, Ian. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, good afternoon, um, everyone. Uh, so I'm Ian McVicker, and it's a pleasure uh, to be speaking to you today about how dealers can use data to transform customer experience. So I'm going to be covering off uh, three kind of key topics uh, as part of this presentation. Um, I'll be giving a recap on the need for UK car dealers to be more customer centric. And then I'm going to outline why uh, we think OEMs and dealers need to work together to maximize the value of their data and leverage that to transform customer experience. Um, as part of that, I'm going to be reflecting on some of our conversations that I and other people in NTT Data have had with OEMs uh, over the last few months about what they see uh, the direction of travel as being. Um, finally, I'm going to share our view of the um, recommended next steps and also our indicative view of the potential uh, benefits of doing so as well. So to get us started, um, I think the need to transform customer experience has been uh, I think long understood by this point, and it's been driven by some long-term industry trends. Now, this has ranged from the evolution of the vehicles uh, themselves through electrification, increased connectivity, but also wider changes in the automotive environment, such as new entrants. I think we've all seen uh, the publicity about Apple uh, entering this market over the past couple of weeks, but also changes to supply chains as well. Now, these trends are actually one of the reasons why I have become increasingly interested in automotive. I've, I've been more data focused uh, previously in my career, but it's because there's so much opportunity with the data that becomes available, but also the fundamental transformation of the car to becoming something that increasingly resembles software uh, than a mechanical device. In addition to these trends, there's also the wider rebenchmarking of customer experience, particularly in digital channels with consumers expecting a high price experience similar, similar to that of Net, Netflix or Amazon. So with the sheer range of data available uh, about and their vehicles, the ongoing growth in digital channels was expected to take advantage of this personalization and also uh, to reduce costs. So I'm terribly sorry there's a delay here, it wasn't, yes there is. Sorry, the button to move the slides is revealed. Um, but however, I think what's actually ended up being the big accelerator, and I say accelerator around this uh, rather than fundamental change, has been uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and accompanying lockdown with the transition to digital touch points rapidly accelerated. Now, our enforced new norm of contactless service and sales um, has, um, I think, shown enough evidence in the research that's been produced that this is what consumers are going to expect to be able to do going forward and make use of these digital channels. At a global level, um, some McKinsey research has found that 80% of customers use online channels uh, during their purchase decision, and 60% find digital channels for booking, paying, and additional services uh, very appealing. And this is from research back in um, October 2020. Now, we've conducted our 
own research at the start of the year um, to understand more about the transition uh, to the use of digital channels. Um, so we asked 2,000 uh, UK car buyers about their views. Now, let's remember that the UK car buyer tends to be a little more conservative than their global peers. And what we have is that 15% intend to only use online platform for car purchases in the future. So that's six times more than purchased their last car online. And what we're also hearing is all of that 15%, 61% of those intending to buy cars exclusively online will do so in the next two years. So as a consequence, uh, some of the uh, online platforms uh, or online first dealers um, are well placed to benefit from from this. Um, they have um, included in the number Kazoo, which became the highest funded startup in UK history earlier this year, and also the fastest unicorn. Now, we've heard a few different dealers uh, about Kazoo's entry to the market. Some of them make sure that this is a good thing for them because it familiar familiarizes consumer with purchasing cars online and will increase traffic to their own websites so consumers say I want to go to a brand that I trust already and who I've purchased from before. However, an alternative view could be that a kazoo or something similar has the potential to be more of an Uber, an innovative entrant who is prepared to invest heavily and with kazoo um, the financial projections that got leaked uh, early last year indicated that they were budgeting for a loss of 70 million pounds in the first three years of operation. Make that investment to establish a dominant position in the market. And I think we can see that investment in the offering they have in terms of the quality of the website, the level of service that they offer, and all. And by that specifically, I'm thinking of the free delivery they offer to any part of mainland UK, regardless of where the car is currently positioned to the dealership. And I think we can also see it in the investment they've made in marketing. So I think the big headline one would be uh, the sponsorship of Everton and sponsoring a Premier League club. Not cheap, to say the least. So. Actually, as part of this webinar, um, we'd like to do a brief poll, actually, um, and we'd very much appreciate your views. So um, if you go to the poll section, um, we're asking the question of will Kazoo or Cinch or similar organizations be the Uber of the market? So we're going to have this up for 15 um, seconds or so. So we can just ask you to um, please vote now. Well, I can tell you, uh, seeing the numbers live, is that it is very back and forth. Um, and I, th I think a very mixed range of opinions here. So um, in terms of the results, and I think this does demonstrate that we are in a real moment of uncertainty here, is that uh, in terms of Wilco Zero Sins or similar organizations be the Uber of the market, 39% said yes, and 36% said no, and 25% don't know. For some reason, I'm thinking it, it reminds me of Scottish independence uh, referendum polls, but, it just so that there there is not a single view out there around this, and it is very much up for grabs. And I think this is reflected in what um, other dealers are doing. They recognise the need to deliver a more customer centric experience. Now, in our white paper, which we published in December um, 2020, uh, and which is also available on the handout section um, of this webinar we outline four key recommendations to transform um, customer experience. The first of these was making data work harder by unifying it, simplifying it, and analyzing it. Secondly, enable digital customer experiences by involving the wider organization in digital marketing. Third, revitalize sales processes to create a customer experience that is more personalized, effective, and successful. And then finally, transforming business models for the new digital world and becoming customer centric, not car sick. Now, from our subsequent conversations um, with dealers, I think it's fair to say they are very much aligned in terms of uh, these recommendations are in investing in data driven projects um, that include rebuilding websites to match best in class personalized retail, investing in marketing tools to provide personalized content, and also redesigning and building in flexibility for customer journeys. And I think the S in brackets is important here. There is no one customer journey. There is a variety of journeys and we need to be able to be adaptable enough, um, particularly in our analytics to take account of that. And if I show you this chart here, this gives you a view of the complexity that we see in the customer journey. 
Now, in our view, because of this complexity, there's a limit of what can be achieved without improving the sharing of data between, the, between dealers, the OEMs, and indeed other players in the market. Now, the complexity of the journey is driven by its omnichannel nature. Although, as, we, as I said earlier, 15% of UK buyers looking to buy exclusively online, that still leaves 85% who see that interaction with the dealership as a crucial touch point. And the interaction in the physical dealership is still seen as the number one most critical touch point. But I think it is also it's the variety of the journeys and the touch points with the dropping in and out of various times that can make it much harder to keep a track of actually where is the customer in the journey. Now, there are a wide variety of use cases to improve customer experience, and we've got a, a number of them up on the screen here as part of this end-to-end -end customer journey, not just covering pre-sales to purchase, but also the after-sales cycle as well. And there is so much opportunity out there, but what we've been hearing um, from the OEMs in our conversations is that they are holding increasing volumes of data that is not being uh, fully utilized or exploited. Now, this is connected to the industry terms we talked about earlier, with the OEMs increasingly gathering volumes of personal and vehicle data. This is both through improving their pre-sales operations with digital channels, capturing um, lead data, but it's also about the connected car revolution with the personal and vehicle data increasingly um, becoming available. And so far, uh, consumers have indicated they are happy for this uh, data to be shared. But thinking about other sectors' experience, that data that is provided needs to be treated with care and with respect to ensure that it remains available um, for usage. But as a consequence, we have seen that OEM is looking at an extensive range of opportunities available for utilizing advanced analytics uh, like machine learning, um, types of AI, and uh, driving it, what's to get the consumer to continue their uh, journey. But there's a challenge for them. And the challenge for them is that to maximize the value of this data and to maximize the insights they can get from their uh, analytics, OEMs also need access to trusted data that is processed by dealers. And they need that because otherwise they lack a true 360 view of the customer. If they only have the view of the car has been sold, but they lack the information about actually what was the customer journey from that first initial contact with the dealer, then they're missing a really vital piece of the jigsaw in terms of understanding what has been the effectiveness of their own campaigns. Now, in our conversations with OEMs, particularly over the past few months, how to work with dealers to maximize the trust data that is available has been the key topic when we're talking about data and data strategy. It is they are very much not looking, well, actually, while they are looking inward at the data available within their own organization, they are also thinking about Mac that is available from um, other organizations at the same time. And I think, although there's been a lot of conversation, uh, certainly at kind of industry level, talking about the potential transition to an agency model, I think the conversations we've been having have been more pragmatic at this point in terms of what are the range of potential uh, relationships we can have with our dealers in order to maximize the sharing of data between parties. And that could involve uh, some sort of tier system, but I think it's, they, they're keen to gauge the appetite from dealers to increase um, data sharing. And I think they also recognize that this needs to be a quid pro, quid, uh, quid pro quo relationship. Both sides need to see the benefit of this for it to work. So if we turn to an example of what that looks like, um, I've pulled out a simple example here, and it is pretty much the most simple example I could find uh, from one of our after sale, after sale customer journey maps to demonstrate how the use of data through the end to end customer journey can be leveraged to transform the customer experience and improve sales. So in, in this example, we have uh, Tom, who is an electric car enthusiast, but still only has a combustion engine vehicle. Now, he has liked Facebook posts from the OEM brand, and they have incorporated it into their customer profile for Tom. Now, Tom's a lucky man and has two cars, so his uh, company car is in the workshop, but he is being um, provided uh, with a courtesy car. Now, in this first scenario, um, because Tom is so eager to return to work because he's already lost um, a couple of hours, 
the service advisor taking notes of that simply offers him the next available comparable courtesy car uh, in order to get him uh, on his way back to work as soon as possible. Now, Tom quickly accepts this because he needs to make up the time he's already lost today. But upon leaving, he overhears another customer being offered an electric car and is then disappointed the option wasn't offered to him. So here we have a missed opportunity to potentially provide a great customer experience and accelerate the sales process at the same time. Now, if we just slightly flip that and the service advisor has at the fingertips, um, actually, you should recommend to this guy an electric car based on the information we have about his customer profile. It, it changes the whole journey because Tom then, let's say he's on the happy path, is pleased to be proactively uh, provided with an electric car for the next day, loves the experience and decides to accelerate his purchase decision for his next personal electric car with the dealer uh, when he returns his courtesy car. Now, what this interaction also does is that it provides the OEM with really vital data points for the marketing as well. So it's very much we need to look at it as the data is being shared between um, the two organizations. And even if it doesn't immediately lead to a sale, it does provide some really vital data points to think about what are our next steps in terms of digital marketing to Tom? Should we be giving him some personalized offers around electric vehicles as a consequence? Now, building the capabilities to enable and benefit from the flow of data uh, throughout the end-to-end -end journey is challenging. This is not going to be a simple case of flicking a switch uh, in order to make this happen. And in our view, this can't be done in a piecemeal manner. You need a data strategy to provide a long-term roadmap to facilitate data sharing with OEMs. Now, data is not simply about leveraging technology, although that is absolutely a critical component, but it's about having wider data capabilities. Now, on this slide here, you kind of see the five domains of data capabilities we consider as part of our data maturity assessment. Now, this is about developing a data vision based on your business priorities. What are those key opportunities that you need data for in order to drive real value for the business? And then based on the gap between your as is and target capabilities, what should you prioritize? Now, as I mentioned earlier, from our conversations with dealers, we know there's a lot of excellent going on, a lot of excellent work going on into individual initiatives. But I think our concern is based on what we've seen in other sectors, unless they are planned as part of a coordinated holistic program, you're not going to maximize the benefit of your investment. Now, to give a high level example, you could purchase a very sophisticated marketing platform but the data being entered into it is flawed. You are not going to obtain the benefits you expected. Now, why is that data flawed? Well, there's a whole number of reasons. It could simply be that the rekeying 10 to 15 times into different applications is causing challenges. It could be a lack of data governance uh, around monitoring, enforcing quality standards. It could be that the people entering the data don't understand the value of it, so therefore don't prioritize it. What you need to do is the assessment to understand what are the root causes and then also look for opportunities for quick wins. Now, this data strategy, we deliver it in six to eight weeks. And as part of the analysis, we identify quick wins that we've found yield economic benefits about two to five times the expenditure on the strategy within six to 12 months. Now, that's nice to start off with, but the key thing is actually to ensure that you invest wisely in future initiatives and ensure they are building towards your business goals in the long term, as opposed to running the risk of accruing technical debt on solutions that superficially fix the problem, but actually don't get to the root causes. Now, as a final thought, um, I will just add in that, in our view, um, a data strategy is there to be implemented, not to be a nice document uh, that sits on the shelf. And we have um, a variety of solutions around uh, creating single views of the customer, maximizing um, the value of your marketing resources through a digital engagement center, and also um, predictive care to think about how to maximize the value of your channels and make sure you're directing um, your customers to the most efficient, but also the most valuable um, channels for them. So I'll leave these uh, up on the screen for you for now, but I am conscious that I am out of time. Um, so thank you very much. As I've explained, there are numerous opportunities to transform the customer experience through leveraging data but the full benefits aren't realized without effective sharing of data between the various players. So to offer you another perspective on this, I'm going to hand you over to Ian Plummer, who's going to tell you more about using data to optimize efficiency within the automotive ecosystem. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Much uh, to you, Ian. A great, great Christian name to start with, but it's a little confusing on the uh, on this the uh, this little uh, webinar today. Um, good afternoon to everybody. I'm going to talk to you a little bit around Water Trader's data capabilities, and you, you know, many of you, I'm sure, know Water Trader well and know the scale and uh, uh, the, the value of the platform. Decided, I think, in two ways here on this chart between the the value of the insights gained from the consumer interactions on the platform as well as the, the interactions around vehicles themselves, both consumer and vehicle data. And we, we believe fundamentally in the value of data at Autotrader. We see around 4,000 touch points every single second on the platform, and it's that that builds uh, the visibility we have. So fundamentally, it's this scale and the, that, that breadth and depth of data that provides a lot of insight and uh, opportunity for our partners to drive efficiency and profitability in these three key areas you see here, around the buyers themselves, the actual car buyers that are out there and how we can understand them, the broader market, pricing, stock, and so on. And then thirdly, some solutions to use data to actually power performance on platforms. So on the, to the first point around understanding buyers and particularly around trends. Um, we've talked a lot around trends just recently. And this chart will uh, give you an idea of what we're seeing very uh, topically right now in terms of how we see the third lockdown playing out. Um, the third lockdown is the big, uh, bold red uh, line in the, in the middle of this chart. You can see the second lockdown is in blue and the first one in the darker color at the bottom of the chart. Now we're talking here about the impact of the lockdowns on the audience of Autotrader. And given that we represent around 75% of the time spent on automotive classified sites in the UK, what happens on Autotrader is probably a, a fair bellwether representation of what's happening in the market. So it's good to see here on this chart that lockdown three is behaving very similarly to lockdown two, and certainly not to lockdown one. We're seeing a good tracking of, uh, of interest and the visits to the platform and the bleeds and so on, showing a good sign of, of consumer interest that seems to be matched by equally some fantastic efforts from retailers and brands in their readiness to manage their way through the lockdown. Now, those trends can also map out into um, some other factors that we've been looking at a lot in the last few months, in particular, as the, the impact of lockdowns and so on successively have changed sort of consumer uh, attitudes to car buying. They've actually increased um, attitudes, or let's say propensity to, to buy cars. Um, it's, it, they, we've seen an increase in consumers' ability to afford cars. Come to that in maybe a moment around uh, economic impacts and the, the amount of household finance, the data that we've got that sees a strong uh, positive indicator. Um, people are actually now more prone to accept the fantastic growth we've seen in digital acceleration by retailers and brands that leads to things like home delivery options. All the more uh, essential right now, given that that's the only option, along with click and, click and collect, to keep our, if you like, our, our digital retailer and brand doors open. So fantastic, again, credit to everybody that's managing to sell the, the sort of 70, 60, 70% 70 of new and used cars that we're seeing at the moment. It might be sort of very negative behind the, the kind of levels we'd like to be seeing and did last year, but nonetheless, reflection of, of the fact that we are seeing this sort of digital engagement from the industry as well as the consumer alike. Equally, uh, an important stat to highlight is the kind of uh, new cohort of buyers that we've seen coming into car buying with people avoiding public transport there, 11% on our platform saying they're typically looking to do that. And 61% saying they're looking to now, um, they're prepared to consider, let's say, uh, an online buying experience if the journey is right. So an opportunity as we go forward and a seize on those trends to improve how we operate and to gain greater efficiency in, in our businesses. On to a, my second point now around the consumer, some audience dashboards that we have around demographic tools and competitor sets. Firstly, to competitor sets. This, um, this chart just uh, tries to map out a typical uh, consumer journey. And uh, as the other Ian just described, we, we, we totally agree that the, the journey is certainly not linear. It's uh, slightly snakes and ladderish. You go forwards and backwards. But this particular snaky journey just describes the actual cars that a particular user has looked at. So this user started their journey looking at a Volkswagen Golf and a used one. You see the red uh, circles here indicate used models. And they ended up buying a new Renault Capture. In the journey that they went on, which typically lasts 60 days, we can see the different cars that they're looking at across new and used and across different segments. And that creates the opportunity to share with the industry, uh, brands in particular, but also retailers, the kind of real world competitor sets that actual consumers look at 
are not the type of A, B, C segment sets that the industry is used to thinking in and comparing their, their, their own performance to their competitors, thanks to. So similarly, we have a, a great view of demographic data based on, again, the behaviors, obviously, of the 60 million or so monthly visitors to our platform that leave their footprints around the platform based on what they're engaging with, what the trends are that they're, they're enjoying and so on. The key theme at the moment is electric vehicles. This chart, without going into detail, just highlights the hot spots on the map, brings out the fact that quite evidently you can see that electric vehicles are attracting older and wealthier buyers to the kind of postcodes you can see on the chart, which would be the recommended uh, headline target areas for brands and retailers to be going after electric vehicle buyers. There are lots of them out there. There are lots of you know, electric vehicles coming into the market. Now, the key, as always, is matching the right car with the right demand and putting things in the right places. My second point, then, is around understanding the market. More specifically, in this chart here, is understanding the general market. What's very often important in our data is, uh, is sharing insights, trends, macroeconomic indicators, if you like, at a national level, and then diving down and enabling a retailer or a brand or a captive finance uh, partner or a leasing partner to actually dive into the granular microeconomic data at a specific local level. So first, at a, at a more national level, this chart talks to our pricing indicators. And you can see here we have several uh, metrics that we talk to. Demand uh, in the red dots, supply in the white ones, our market health indicator, which is the reflection of the balance between those two, demand and supply. And then on the right, you can see the retail price movements year on year for each of the months. Just took a snapshot here of uh, November data. And to give you an example, if you take the, the petrol case here, you've got... The, the white dot of supply, which is uh, behind the demand in the red dot, which is positive. So you've got a, a, a strong growth of market health, which led in this case to a growth of pricing of petrol from 8% up on like-for-like -like cars on a year-on-year -year basis to 9% up on a like-for-like year-on-year basis. So strong growth in petrol. And the opposite occurred, as you can see there highlighted in electric, where although demand was growing very strongly, that that red line up 85%, it was exceeded by an even greater level of supply growth. So bringing that down now to a, a slightly lower level, if you like, of analysis, um, understanding detailed stock positioning, at a, at a, at a, as I said, at a local level is, is fundamentally important. The, the exact same car won't perform in the same way in two different locations. It may do, but there's a very good chance that it won't. This particular example highlights a Ford Fiesta ZTEC hatchback and it, we, we, we take the, the indicator, the, the reference here as being what we call our retail rating. That's the intrinsic local balance of supply and demand for that particular model. And you can see in this example that there's a correlation of the, the higher the retail rating, the quicker the car turns in terms of days to sell. And the same car at the same point in time turned in 30 days in Scotland and 43 just across the waters in Northern Ireland. Similarly, we, we can map that same indication of retail rating strength in terms of quartiles here on the left. You can see uh, quartiles of stock on our platform. The higher the retail rating on the right-hand side of that bar chart, sort of 80 to 100, the faster the days to turn, around 45, and the reverse supplies. On the right-hand side, you can see there's a correlation there of, of retailers on our platform and their average retail rating positioning of their stock compared to days to sell speed of sale, of sale being a vital characteristic of profitability. Having the right car, putting it in the right place is a real driver of performance, using data to drive efficiency and profitability. This, this, this slide shows you how that um, comes to life also in our retailer accelerator tools that, are, that retailers and uh, equally at a national level, uh, manufacturing captive partners can take advantage of. So you've got here an indication of some of those um, points I described, such as retail rating, but equally, how well the car is merchandised, how well the, the advert is performing, is it getting better ad views than its equivalent cars in the same local area or nationally, um, how, how many other alerts are being dealt with and so on. So it's using data to push performance all of the time and making sure that stock is really working for our partners. Similarly, pricing data. And again, at a, at a macro national level, we share pricing data very widely across the industry. Um, during the course of last year, that felt particularly critical as uh, we shared data that proved that the balance of supply and demand indicated a likely increase in price and then confirmed that increase in price. 
And we saw, as you can see there, that the sort of hill that that car is going up in the middle of your, your screen, the prices grew throughout the, the whole of the uh, post-lockdown period of 2020 and continue to be right now 7% or so ahead of like-for-like -like cars uh, on a year-on-year -year basis. So strong growth in the market that's helped retain more margin, helped make better data-led decisions, um, and helped to preserve, I would suggest, equally longer-term residual values for our leasing of the manufacturer partners too, helping sell the next new car as well as retain better margins on the used cars we sell today. Now, if I take that again to a, a, a more local level, you can imagine how we, we can bring this to life in a, in, a, in, a, in a retailer situation. This chart talks to the need to price cars to market. On the left-hand side, you can see different quartiles of stock that are banded in terms of their days to sell. Again, days to sell drives return on investment, drives profitability in used cars. So the, the blue bar at the top of each of those, those uh, shaded light blue bars indicates the first price point of cars brought into, into the market. Those that were brought into the market virtually bang on 100, sell at virtually that as well, 99.7 or so on this chart. If you look to the right-hand side, cars that are brought in above the market at north, north of 101%, sell below 98%. And they take more than 90 days to do that, so they're eating into funding and to your profitability. The right-hand side, you can see the days to sell banding shows that this isn't a, anything like a race to the bottom. It's about transparency and sharing to consumers price indicators that show cars that are well-positioned and sharing that same data to a retailer that can avoid holding a car for 90 to 120 days, which will cost more than a thousand pounds of discount on that vehicle. The third point I wanted to highlight is how we can actually use data, not just for insights and decision-making, but to drive uh, solutions that can become web-based solutions in particular, facing either your internal teams or facing through to consumers themselves. So there are various examples on the chart here around valuations, um, valuations that can be shared uh, to consumers on platforms through API links into retail or brand websites, stock management APIs that can equally feed into uh, sort of mission control type dashboards and management information that's critical at retailer level, for example, uh, and other vehicle metrics that you'll be able to use within data sets to consistently manage and perform uh, stronger, uh, drive performance uh, in a stronger way throughout your business. This next example is, is a way of bringing to the, to, to the fore the need for consistency in an omni-channel experience today. Used cars have traditionally been relatively easily shared across platforms, the same car being seen at the same price with the same images and so on across a retailer or a brand you've used vehicle locator or on a site like Autotrade or another third party uh, classified sites. That's less often been the case for new cars, but it is now with the use of APIs to share search taxonomy data and so on around exactly bringing this to life, the same car seen in all these different locations and then brought to life equally in the showroom on the point of sales systems of, of the sales teams, enabling a consistent, coherent, and I think better, consumer solution, as well as a more efficient retailer solution. An example of some of the uh, best practices we've seen is, is a recent study we carried out with, uh, with Virtue Motors, who took the challenge of really trying to sift through the different systems they had and the different sources of data they had and used our stock and search API solutions to drive a greater level of consistency, uh, driving performance and efficiency, and consistent use of their, their key metrics across their business which I believe has, has driven their revenue and profit performance in a very positive direction. Huge credit to them for the work they've done there. So just to recap, the three areas that uh, we can see that are really vital in terms of driving value from data, firstly around the buyers themselves, understanding their motives and being able to match the right car to the right locations. Second, understanding the market and, and being able to make sure we're driving the right data-led decisions. And thirdly, using a data in a very open format, sharing you know, API type formats across different partners from the likes of an order trader, an OEM, a retailer partner, and so on in a, an open and collaborative manner. That's me. Fantastic. Thank you to, to both Ian's for a fascinating presentation there. So we'll, we'll now begin the the Q and A. Um, there is still time to submit questions. Um, we've had a good good handful in already, but 
please do take the time over the next 10, 15 minutes or so to ask any questions that you want to. You want to. Um, so just purely because it just relates just to what you've been talking about, Ian, there's a question that's come in asking about one of the charts you showed, um, showed the rise of used car values, used vehicle values and RVs. Question asks, is this driven by customer demand that's being redirected to used more than new cars, given the, the kind of supply issues that the, the lockdowns and everything has, have caused? I don't honestly think it's been a redirection from new to used necessarily. I think both new and used saw a, a, a strong level of demand post lockdown. We saw um, across the second half of the year, for example, visits to the, to the platform grew by 25%. The market between lockdowns for used cars grew on average around 3.5%, I think, between the lockdown one, lockdown two. Um, and, and new cars equally performed very well in, in, in that same period. So I, I don't think it's a transfer of one to another. Definitely the pricing, though, is the reflection of very strong demand. The used car market is clearly four times bigger than the new car market, you know, whatever the, the, the ups or downs in particular year. So I think both are seeing high demand and relatively constrained supply. Okay, thank you. Uh, a bunch of questions come in for, for Ian, Ian M. If I can direct direct these these to you, these next couple. Um, so one somebody asks, is there concern about dealers sharing information with an OEM as it could be shared with a competitor, given that they're all independent franchise businesses? And if so, what can be done to protect that, that information? Um, yes, I think temporarily donning my legal hat, which I once donned back in the day at university, um, I think that comes down to you need to have a pretty watertight tight agreement uh, with between the OEM and the dealer. I think have some pretty um, clear boundaries in terms of where that data, where you want that data to go. Because I think to use that horrible cliche, data is the new oil and it is a valuable asset and therefore you need to ensure you protect it. But there are, because it is such a valuable asset, there are a whole range of tools that are becoming available to help protect your data as well. Um, now, Entity Data have a partnership with a company called um, X8, who have a product which is um, basically ink, ink marks data. So in terms of if you share that data with another company, you can then see where it gets subsequently shared to as well. So I think there are options around it. but. I think it probably be um, it needs to be a trusted relationship between the OEM and dealer. If you're constantly worried about getting stabbed in the back, then actually there's probably something else you need to be looking at in the relationship rather than the data per se. Yeah, I think that that's it's certainly feedback that we've we've had in the past, but I think times have moved on, and particularly the the very pro proactive kind of major groups are now. They've cemented that relationship with the, with the OEM as a partnership, as opposed to a a senior partner and a and a, a customer in a way that's kind of sourcing cars from them. So um, another another question to you, Ian Ian M, if that's okay. Um, you yep. talked in your presentation about unifying, simplifying, and analysing data. Um, sounds like quite a big task. Is this something that needs to be done at a network? wide level or can or major groups only or, or can can an average kind of regional dealer group get to grips with that um so i think my view is that uh, you shouldn't be trying to eat the elephant whole on this i think if you go in with a view of actually um we just want to unify all of our data get it all in one place and then we'll figure out what we want to do with it then you're you're not looking at the problem uh, in the right way i think you need to be looking at it do we have data in uh, disparate locations that we can bind it together could potentially derive, derive some great business value for us and then try and understand actually let's focus on doing that part first of all and demonstrating that there is a benefits case and a business case um, for doing that as opposed to i think it's the um, data strategy is driven by what's the business value you want to get out of um, your data and i think that needs to drive um, the unification of it as well all right. Okay. Thank you. And another another one for you, Ian, Ian M. Do you consider the online digital trends to be reflected in more high street physical branches or pop-ups? What other impacts could digital have on the service experience? Um, so I think there's a variety of interesting things that are happening um, right now in the space. I, mean, I, um, I was speaking to some of my colleagues in Japan 
um, a couple of weeks ago. And one of the innovations that they are potentially looking at bringing in is around um, facial recognition in dealerships. Uh, in terms of we want to be able to um, sense how people are feeling when they walk in the door and then how they feel when they go out door. So I think it is almost trying to, it's almost the digitizing of the physical space as well, which does actually come with its own problems. But I'm not entirely sure how I feel about um, that experience in terms of my facial expressions being to some extent uh, tracked and monitored to see how I've reacted to an offer. And I think that I think that that is one of the really interesting points around um, cars increasingly become software and actually becoming more like a software industry in terms of we need to keep in mind that although there can be disputes about actually who owns this data, is it the dealer or is it the OEM? Actually, the customer owns that data. And are they willing for you to use it? Are they happy to give their consent? And it is about making sure that people understand the value of how you're using the data, but also you're transparent about it as well, I think, and that you're not perhaps stepping over ethical boundaries. Okay, I think I, know, I don't know whether facial recognition would work with me because I think whenever I'm I'm shopping, I have a pretty sour face, no matter what I'm what I, what I'm doing. Ian Plummer, I, do you have a kind of view view on that? The kind of what the, the impact digital can have on the service experience for consumers. I think the we, we're already seeing that digital is having a huge impact on car buying and uh, across the the ownership experience. That that'll be the same. I, I completely agree with with Ian that the car is now a thing that connected to the internet of, of things and it's a very much sort of a, a connected mobile device almost so that will see a huge uh, raft of opportunities across the the industry and to the point about the data i think the consumer owns the data completely agree with that point um there's always been this battle hasn't there between uh, historically retailers and manufacturers who owns the, the consumer i think nobody does that's the key point um, and the value is in making sure that everybody can actually deliver something useful to a consumer. Just quickly to the first point, I think the main thing is we're seeing that digital uh, engagement of car buying really change the, 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 the way that we, a, a consumer is actually looking to go through the car buying journey, which is that you know, snake-like journey we talked about earlier. I think the retailers are now are massively engaging with that opportunity to do things differently. Um, and embrace that opportunity rather than maybe in the past fear it. Mm. Okay, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, another question has come in. It doesn't specify which Ian, so actually I will ask you both if that's okay. Oh, you um, sorry? Shall I answer <laughs> it? No. <laughs> uh, so Ian M first. Regarding the varied customer journey online in dealership or complex mixture, what would you see as the key milestones in a digital transformation beyond the basics of reservation and click and collect? Um, so I think um, the, the key milestone, I think that kind of hints at the kind of the bigger picture I showed earlier around the customer journey is that don't just think about the customer journey as I'm thinking about buying a car, I've bought a car and then we'll wait two years and then you'll decide you need to buy a car again. It is very much about that end to end journey. And I think at this point, this is an opportunity for um, other de so deal with other than your kazoos or your cinches to actually differentiate themselves because they're not really focusing on um, service at this point. They've kind of placed that to, to place that to one side, although because you are doing some uh, limited um, servicing options. But it is you have a whole range of opportunities to really build in that relationship with the customer, really establish your brand in their head, build that trust, and actually. Give them a really great experience and then when it is at the point where they're deciding to buy a new car they are immediately thinking of you and i think with the investments that are being made to build out the online presence then it could be that actually i know and trust that brand they have a good experience i'm going to stick with them i think it, it, i think that's why i see it's been a key milestone it's be seeing it fully end to end um as opposed to almost looking at it as the chunks of who controls what okay in plumber what's your would you agree with that, absolutely? Yeah, I think those are all really good points. I think to answer the question uh, in a slightly different way, for, for me, it's fundamentally about making sure you've got transparency to begin with. So that means sharing your your stock in a very clear, clear and simple way across all platforms so that it's consistent and you're not sort of being confused by seeing the same car at a different price potentially in different platforms. All easier done on used cars historically than on new, but that journey is now very much happening on new. 
But then I think the rest of the digital transformation is, those, is there are different bricks. And I think they can all be put in place uh, in, in different orders. Don't aim for doing everything in one go. Most consumers aren't looking to do the very full uh, online journey and just clicking a button. But they might very well be interested in, you mentioned reservations or click and collect, but probably to, you know, part exchange and finance are the two clunkiest part of the parts of the buying experience today. The consumers sort of fear most, that lack transparency most. So really engaging with those ones, building it in, and then getting to the point where there is a reservation deposit, maybe an online transaction at the end of that, is probably my recommendation. But key to it all, I think, is keeping in mind that consumers still enjoy the retail experience when it delivers them the emotional positive sort of angles that they enjoy of driving, but also seeing, smelling, feeling, touching the, the, the car that they are, they're interested in and the advice from a retailer. So it's that personality and warmth that I think still needs to come through the digital transformation plans that anybody may be put, looking to put in place. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, Ian M., um, with your experience um, in in kind of wider industries, what what can dealers learn from the other industries out there on how they best use and manage manage data? Um, so I think actually I'd say the key lesson learned is it's around it's around people actually uh, rather than necessarily data or technology, and that is I think data literacy. Um, I mean, if you speak to most CIOs, they say what's your number one barrier? Um, to successfully implement your programs, and it is a lack of data literacy um, in uh, the people in the organization already. Now, that creates a bunch of barriers. Um, first of all, in terms of if your senior leadership doesn't really understand data or doesn't understand the value it can drive, then they're possibly not making the best decisions about the future direction of what projects and programs to invest in, or at least not seeing the synergies that could take place. If you're investing a lot of money in customer journey mapping, you should be looking at the data that accompanies that rather than necessarily doing them as two separate projects without connecting them together. Um, but I think it's also about really engaging people throughout the organization because they are the ones you have to, in quite a few cases, enter the data so you want them as motivated as possible. But it's also they're the ones who can recognize the really great opportunities that might otherwise be missed. Um, we, we, we've done this. A number of times which is go and speak to the people on the shop floor and understand actually what do you think the opportunities are for using predictive analytics and machine learning and they're able to pull out some very specific examples that otherwise might not drive value for a lot of companies in the same sector but for that specific company does drive a lot of value because of their specific circumstances the legacy technology they have in place so it's about empowering people to come forward with their recommendations and suggestions and it is that education piece which is critical